You're listening to episode 107 of the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, I'm chatting with registered dietitian Mandy Rother about how to use functional medicine to overcome PMDD. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, a registered dietitian, nutrition business coach, and online entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience in online business. And I'm here to show you everything I've learned about creating a life and a business that nourishes you. On this podcast, we'll talk about the lifestyle habits, practical strategies, mindset shifts, and leaps of faith required to build a healthy body, a powerful mind, a strong spirit, and a successful business. Hey there, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, and today's episode is special because it's actually on a topic that we've never covered before. It's actually kind of ironic we've never covered it before because it's a woman's hormonal issue. And as you guys probably know by now, we talk about hormones a lot on this show, partially because it's so important for women's health to be thinking about our hormones and partially because there's so much misinformation or just lack of information out there that affects our ability as women to be able to take care of our hormones. So we talk about hormones a lot on this show. However, we've never talked about PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Now, this is a condition that has a lot of mystery around it. It's not well understood by the conventional medical world. And there's honestly not a lot of practitioners out there that specifically focus on PMDD because it is a rather complicated condition and takes a lot of time and learning to be able to understand how to best help people with PMDD. And that's honestly why I just love our guest today because she has really put in the time and energy into researching the condition and working with clients on healing this condition. So she really knows what she's talking about when it comes to overcoming PMDD. And one of the most important things she covers is this idea that PMDD is not fixable. And if you ever experience an improvement in your PMDD, that that somehow means you didn't have it in the first place. So if you're somebody who's been told that before, or you're someone with PMDD and you're just like, there's no way that this is ever going to get better, then this episode is for you. And even if you just know somebody that you love, a friend, a family member that has PMDD, this is going to be something that can help you help them get the support that they need in order to improve their health. So today's guest is registered dietitian Mandy Rother. Mandy is a functional dietitian nutritionist diagnosed with PMDD 15 years ago, and her own story has included everything from dark rock bottoms to symptom-free years. On top of that, IBS, PCOS, and depression were worsening her clinical symptoms. For the longest time, she felt broken and at war with her body. Fed up with Band-Aid solutions, she decided to forge her own path. Over time, she was able to put her metabolic puzzle together for a comprehensive approach to relief. This path of trial and error compelled her to study integrative and functional nutrition so she could help others with PMDD recover the way she was able to. You can learn more about Mandy on her website and follow along with her on Instagram at pmdd.dietitian. Now, Mandy is one of my clients. We actually worked together one-on-one to launch her business last year, and she's now also a member of my mid-tier coaching program for alumni of the Nutrition Business Accelerator clients. And she has just worked so hard on creating a really effective approach to PMDD. One of the things that we talk about in my work with business clients is actually helping them come up with a process for solving the problem that their clients come to them with. And so Mandy has a really awesome, well-thought-out, well-researched, and evidence-based approach to helping clients overcome PMDD. And we're really going to get into some of the nitty gritty details about how she helps people do this because it is a condition that has so much confusion and misunderstanding around it. And for many people with PMDD, they don't believe that they can heal. And so if nothing else, if that's the only thing that you get from this episode today is that healing is possible, then 
we'll have done our jobs. But I know you're going to learn a lot. So without further ado, here is my friend and client, Mandy Rother. All right, everyone. Well, I am so excited to have with me on the show today, Mandy Rother. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast, Mandy. Thanks for having me, Laura. Yeah. And this is, I think, the first time we're ever specifically talking about PMDD on this podcast. So I'm super excited to have you here. I know that this is your main area of expertise, and it's also something that you've dealt with yourself. So it makes you the best person to share with the audience about what they can do if they are struggling. So just to get people acquainted with you, I would love to hear your story. How did you become passionate about helping women with PMDD? Yeah, definitely. I know we always feel obligated, right, to start with our credentials, but I think more importantly is is the story behind that. And so I've been a dietitian for over 10 years, but really focused on my private practice, supporting people with PMDD over the last year. And how I got here is I was diagnosed probably 15 years ago, and my story is like so many others. I went through conventional treatment after conventional treatment with little success or at times feeling even worse. And with each thing I tried that didn't work, I just became more and more hopeless. And there was this turning point where enough was enough. And I was studying to be a dietitian at that time. And I began exploring this world of of functional medicine for my own treatment, along with, you know, different modalities of therapy, which is always an important combination. So throughout my career, you know, I went through a few different jobs that ultimately landed in working in like the wellness space. And that's where this like passion really flourished in this intense study of functional medicine and nutrition myself. So with all of that, now today I focus on bringing that to my clients and helping them take a different approach so they don't feel like they're just slapping band-aids on the symptoms, hoping for the best the next month, that they really feel confident that relief is possible and they can get at the underlying root cause causes of those symptoms. Amazing. So for those audience members who don't know what PMDD is, and I I know we want to, you know, spell out that acronym for people, what is PMDD and how does it differ from PMS? Yeah, really an important question because unfortunately there's not enough awareness about this condition. And there may even be listeners that are starting to hear us talking about the different symptoms and saying, hmm, I wonder if that could be me because it often goes undiagnosed. So PMDD stands for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And simply put, it's like PMS on steroids. Yet it's very different than than PMS, both in the severity and what causes it. That's what really is the differentiating factor. And a lot of times it's seen as a mental health disorder. And indeed it is in that DSM diagnostic manual that psychologists use, but it's really unique in that it's both a gynecological condition and a mood disorder because they're both biological and psychological causes. The difference between PMS, let's talk about that a little bit more, again, is the in the intensity of the symptoms. So there can be similar physical symptoms like you name it, bloating, breast tenderness, headaches, kind of that water retention and swelling before the cycle, insomnia even, but there's also psychological or mood symptoms that come along with it. And it may be depression or anxiety or even things like rage or increased irritability. A lot of times people talk about brain fog and how it impacts their work. There can be kind of this hypersensitivity to outside stimuli. So sounds, you know, touch and an increased feelings of like insecurity. So there's, it shows up differently in every single person, but they might have a combination of the physical and the psychological symptoms. Now, when somebody is getting diagnosed with PMDD, I you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I have a feeling it's probably accurate. Do you feel like it's pretty hard for somebody to get that PMDD diagnosis? Absolutely. And a lot of things can be at play. Like I mentioned, there's not enough awareness out there. So people either go undiagnosed because they don't know about it themselves to ask, hey, doc, do I have this? So that's really the first step. But what I often see and what people report kind of out there in the PMDD community is that they were misdiagnosed for a long time, either other hormonal disorders that were playing into PMDD. And there's kind of a side note debate about the hormonal influence, um, which we can talk about more, but they might have coexisting conditions, both PMDD and endometriosis, for example, or so it might be diagnosed as, you know, depression or bipolar or something like that, or as kind of just PMS without 
realizing the severity and the impact on their lives. Mm -hmm. Is there specific diagnostic criteria that like, like I'm thinking about PCOS, how there's like specific things that if you check a certain number of symptoms or presentation that Mm -hmm. you get diagnosed, is it the same way with PMDD? Yeah. So it's typically made after, well, the first requirement is tracking your cycle for two months and sharing those symptoms with your doctor. And there has to be at least five of this list of symptoms present with at least one of the psychological symptoms. And they have to be cyclical in nature, meaning they're present, like for example, the week or two before the cycle, including sometimes around ovulation for some people. And then they go away soon after that menstrual cycle starts. There can also be what's called PME or premenstrual exacerbation. And that refers to when someone has, let's say, underlying depression or anxiety and those symptoms worsen with the cycle. So it's still cyclical in nature, but a little bit different. And that one isn't as official of a diagnosis, but still really important to discuss with your doctor to guide the treatment options. So is there anything as somebody with PMDD yourself that you would want someone who maybe suspects they have PMDD or has been diagnosed with PMDD, is there anything that you would want them to know? Yeah, this is something I get fired up about, actually, because I see a lot of discussions out there that if you recover or for example, if you become symptom free, well, maybe you didn't have PMDD in the in the first place. And so I am like on a mission to spread the word that I really believe recovery is possible, that healing is possible. And I think that just can help people feel that little glimmer of hope that the actions that they take matter and can make a difference. And what I see happen is, you know, I find a lot of people ask, when will there be a cure for this? And just like many conditions out there, there's not like a single medication or a single cure. There's a lot of information around SSRIs, for example, a type of antidepressant or certain types of birth control, but those don't work for everyone. And so they're not a cure for everyone. And I believe that's because everyone has a different cause or different contributing factors that are driving the condition to take place. And it's it's more it's not as simple as, this is your diagnosis, this is your medication. So people get kind of stuck in that and it, it can be really, really frustrating. So I would say that the most important thing is to know that relief is possible. And I'll, I'll add a number two, <laughs> I can't help myself, but the second thing I would add is tracking symptoms like we talked about to help not only support that diagnosis, but also to give you information to help guide your treatment approach. And so the first thing is to shift the way you see symptoms. And, and this is a hard thing to do, especially when they're plaguing you every single month, but kind of shifting this mindset um, to more curiosity. So So why are these symptoms occurring and viewing them as signs of an imbalance versus the problem themselves? And when I see people do that, it helps them kind of shift shift their mindset in a way where they have more curiosity about how their bodies work. And I know that's the silver lining of PMDD for me that if my symptoms do kind of bubble up again, it's almost like my barometer for my, my lifestyle. Do I need to make shifts to support my physical health, my spiritual or mental health, and kind of recalibrate my habits to to get back on track. Awesome. And how does having PMDD impact your life, both as a practitioner as and as an entrepreneur? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so I can, you know, talk about the past and talk about today. You know, before I would say it really had a major impact on every area of my life. You know, when I was diagnosed years ago, back in college, you know, from, you know, my studies, relationships, my hobbies, you know, I was in this place where I was suffering in silence, especially before I was diagnosed, but still kind of pushing through to not let any balls drop in my life, to save face and and still perform. And on the outside to everyone else, I was killing it, right? Like I 4.0, three majors, I was that kind of college student. But eventually I I crashed and I think PMDD kind of uncovered what was going on and that I needed to slow down and rebalance my life. Not that that was the cause, but definitely highlighted that for me. And I know in my, my professional life, when I had another time of more severe symptoms, I definitely felt fearful to share that journey because in the professional setting, there's so many stigmas around mental health and especially women being fearful of being seen as hormonal, for example. 
it is hard to share that story with others. And so now over time, I've become more comfortable talking about it and really on a mission to share it more because I think it'll help people learn how to, again, work with their bodies, work with their cycles, where they can actually use it to their benefit and use it to their power. So for example, there's you know this concept of cycle syncing where we can look at the natural ebbs and flows of our mood and energy and how social we feel, how creative we feel, how much rest we need, and use that to guide our workflow and how we interact with others. And so now my my symptoms are fairly minimal as far as PMDD goes, but I still definitely notice, you know, fatigue before my cycles or things that are, rather than being just like downright exhausted, can't get out of bed, it's a little bit more of a need for rest, right? So we think about reducing the severity of your symptoms, but it might look like reducing the number of clients I see that week for not planning big presentations. Whereas at the part of my cycle where I feel the best, feel the most vibrant, I might do more social activities outside of work and more presentations, more kind of connecting with others when I feel more up to it. So mm-hmm. kind of helps to guide that workload throughout the month. Yeah. Now, is that something you plan in advance knowing like when about that's going to be for you or is it a little bit more of a reactive decision? Because I know we had a interview with Barian Barry who talked about like entrepreneurial activities and lining that up with your cycle. And I was mentioning like, oh, it sounds like a really cool thing. But for me, one of the hard things is that my cycle is a little inconsistent. It's not like totally inconsistent, but it might vary a few days here and there, which over the course of a year is like, oh, that could literally mean like something I think is going to be luteal phase is like follicular phase, Mm -hmm. or I could be on my period that week. So is that something where you're just, you know, that week kind of making some changes or do you go more far out in advance to actually adjust your calendar to account for that? Yeah, both, I think. And I think the most important thing is that it shouldn't add stress to your life. It should feel like a simple approach where you're really tuning in and listening to what your body needs. So I think the first place to start, in my opinion, is in the moment. So a lot of you know people talk about self-care and self-care stuff and recommendations are everywhere. Beyond self-care, I think about it as self soothing. So in the moment, recognizing your, your needs and even, you know, honoring your limitations that day with a lot of grace. And so in the moment or that given week, it might look like, oh, I was planning to do an interval workout today, but I actually feel like some gentle yoga would serve me best. Or I didn't plan a workout today, but I am super irritable and I want to go lift some heavy weights just to give an example from an exercise perspective. And it might look like pulling in some resources throughout the workday if you're, if someone's feeling a little bit more dysregulated, you know, bringing in different kind of connecting the mind to the body, grounding exercises, breathing exercises, things to give extra support, even if their job doesn't allow for kind of this cyclical living in my life. Since becoming an entrepreneur, I've been like mostly pregnant or breastfeeding. So I haven't had the the PMDD cycles in the last you know year or so. But, you know, I think it definitely makes a difference on, you know, when I worked in a more corporate setting, the social activities I would choose and feel up for and giving myself permission to to make changes in a given week if I needed to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that kind of behavior should go for all all women at all stages of their life, because even with I'm sure you could you know, speak to this better than I can with being pregnant or postpartum. Like there's probably a lot of adjustments that you have to make because of physically how you feel. Like I have a, I don't know what it is. I have a bunch of pregnant clients right now and it's like, maybe it's just something in the water lately, but, um, but a lot of them are in their first trimester and it's really interesting to see the range of severity of symptoms where it's like some people are doing just fine and it's like, "Mm, this is easier than I thought it was going to be. And then there's people who really don't feel well and they have to seriously change their like how they're approaching their business during that time. So I think overall women should be giving themselves a lot more grace around that stuff. And if it's it's someone with PMDD and you kind of know that's this predictable cycle of like ups and downs beyond obviously getting help with that and minimizing the symptoms themselves, I do feel like, you know, if you can create your lifestyle so that you actually account for those 
those fluctuations that that can be really helpful too. Yeah, definitely. So what are some of the hurdles that you see when women are seeking treatment for PMDD and are there alternative options to what women are typically presented with? Yeah. And I think it comes back to that that cure mindset that we talked about. And I think what happens is it leads to like trying single solutions at a time. I'm going to try this medication, then that medication, you know, oftentimes I'll get lists from clients and I had my own list of all the medications I've tried that that didn't work. And sometimes, you know, and I'll put it right out there that sometimes medications are necessary too. And there's no shame in that, but oftentimes whether someone needs medication or not, they can't work alone. There's things that we can do to support the function of that med or to, to support the whole person approach if, if meds are not needed. And so there are definitely a lot of alternative approaches where we can look at the whole person. And that's really what I'm passionate about. When we think about like potential causes of PMDD, this is where the research is really developing. So maybe let's touch on that and then come back to a, a few examples. But um, the kind of the working theory is that it's a Uh, hormone change sensitivity. So how the brain reacts to normal fluctuations of hormones throughout the month. So it's not necessary or always a hormone imbalance. Although I believe hormonal imbalances can exacerbate the PMDD that's already there. And so when we think about this, we can actually use my example. It's kind of interesting when we start to uncover like the different, you know, potential biological causes, I had the cards stacked against me genetically. So there can be a genetic component in a, in a wide percent of people, but genetics doesn't mean that that's your, that's your destiny forever. There are things you can do. So as an example, I had SNPs or genetic variations that impacted how serotonin, that calming neurotransmitter, how, how it worked in my brain. So that was a relief for me because it started to explain why the traditional SSRIs didn't work. And on top of that, histamine can be involved. And if they're listeners with PMDD, they may have read an article or two about how histamine is connected. For me, I have genetic variations that like my body kind of suck at producing the enzymes to break down histamine. And that can create symptoms like anxiety, irritability, insomnia, especially the insomnia that occurs around ovulation. And if we add on top of that, which was the case with me, too much estrogen, there's this interplay between estrogen and histamine where you have too much estrogen that impacts estrogen that impacts histamine metabolism and vice versa, that affects the GABA receptors in your brain that also impact your mood and and how calm or not calm you feel. So you can kind of start to see there's this connection between genetics, potentially hormones, our brain chemistry, and we can layer on top of that digestive health, right? A lot of conditions out there, hormone conditions or autoimmune conditions, you name it, have their roots in digestive disorders or um, even just suboptimal function. And that can impact how we absorb nutrients, how we metabolize and detox hormones, things like that. And it can all kind of these things layer on top of each other and can exacerbate those symptoms. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, because a lot of the stuff you're talking about, I feel like is not stuff you would ever hear from a conventional medical practitioner. And I, I never want to be like doctor bashing on this show. They have their own unique set of skills. A lot of times that does relate back to prescribing medication. Like that's a big focus in medical school, but I don't think things like histamine intolerance and like, you know, genetic SNPs and how that can affect your serotonin uptake or breakdown or whatever kind of different things that it can affect. I don't think that that's made its way into med school at this point. So really anyone who knows about those kind of things is generally self-educated in a lot of cases. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of what you know is coming from you actually looking at the research and not necessarily like being taught any of this as a dietitian. I know I didn't get taught this at, at dietetic school. So I wonder if that's one of the reasons why a lot of women believe that PMDD can't be reversed or I always get, I'm always cautious about using the word cured because it's even with PCOS, like I feel like you can have PCOS and get to a state of health where there's literally no symptoms of it because you're taking care of what your body needs to not present those symptoms. But if you don't treat your body the way it needs to be treated, like the, the condition will start to present itself again. So it's not that you're curing it, especially if there's genetic components, like you're not curing your genes, you're just creating the environment for your genes to operate optimally. So I wonder if that's one of the reasons why so many women are 
under the impression that PMDD isn't fixable or it can't get better because if they're if you're just looking at the medical model, there's probably limitations as to what medicine can really do for any of those situations. Like you mentioned the gut health stuff being involved. I mean, even if we're just looking at histamine, you can have excessive histamine production in your gut that's happening from dysbiosis that it may not matter what you eat. You're like always a little bit like overloaded with histamine. So do you think that's, I mean, I don't know if there's somebody out there being like PMDD cannot be cured and you shouldn't even be trying to like get rid of it. Or is it more just, there's so much, there's so many layers to it that if you're just getting one or two of those layers, it's probably not actually going to go away. Yeah, that and that's exactly how I think of it, like kind of peeling back the onion, right? And figuring out, and again, even if someone is in a place where they need medication because their symptoms are so severe and it's impacting their life and it's making a dent in those symptoms, beautiful, right? People first and foremost have to be safe and be able to, to live their lives. But beyond that, like I said, it, it can't work in a, in a vacuum. We need to support that. And for each person, really the solution may be a little bit different. And oftentimes, like if we're trying, let's say what our friend tried, who has a similar condition or the same condition, it can be really frustrating. You start to feel like you internalize that something's wrong with me. Why didn't that work with me for me? And even in, in my clients with PMDD, there, there's not like one PMDD protocol that works for everyone that I just dole out to everyone, right? It's very individualized and, and everyone has a, a different story behind that. So I'm just thinking of a, a couple of clients, you know, that had really good success within a, a couple months of major symptom reduction. And one, it was heavily tied to her, her blood sugar inflammation. She had really elevated inflammation markers and her histamine load where another client, it was actually, her condition was being exacerbated by hypothyroidism. She had undiagnosed hypothyroidism and had no idea. And it was having a big impact on her mood. And then we also did some advanced testing and she had different fatty acid imbalances impacting her mood and brain health and really low vitamin D. So, you know, just a couple examples along with mine that each person's puzzle will be put together a little bit different, but all those pieces always connect. Mm-hmm. So on that note, how does functional testing come into play when you're helping someone overcome PMDD? Yeah, really good question. This is a place where I see a lot of frustration out there because people want data, they want testing. And because there's no single blood test that diagnoses PMDD, people can feel kind of invalidated, right? But it doesn't make the condition any less real. But just because those types of tests are not used for diagnostic purposes doesn't mean they're not helpful for for guiding the approach. And so there are some basic labs that I think everyone should have and explore when they suspect PMDD. And, And again, and other common issues that may be related. So I almost always check thyroid hormones to, and not just a simple TSH, which is often what insurance will be covering or billed for, but a full in-depth thyroid panel. And then looking at not the conventional lab ranges or the standard reference ranges, but optimal, I like to say more picky ranges to, to see if it truly is optimal thyroid function. So that along with vitamin D levels, like I mentioned, certain blood sugar markers, even things beyond just your fasting glucose, your A1C, a marker of, of insulin, insulin itself or something called C-peptide, those sorts of things can be helpful to see how blood sugar might be playing a role. And beyond that, we get a little fancy, right? Like we, there's in-depth nutrient tests uh, or tests that, and that can look at kind of neurotransmitter balance in the brain, like organic acid testing, um, adrenal testing. A lot of times people will talk about HPA access function. So testing your actual stress hormone levels and then hormone tests. People want to test their hormones and they get pushed back saying that it's not going to make a difference. It's a normal hormonal fluctuation. What's the point? What I do see it be helpful at times to look at, is there an imbalance in the kind of your ratios of hormones of estrogen compared to progesterone. The other thing sometimes I'll find is high levels of androgens, like in PCOS, high levels of DHEA or testosterone and things like that. And then gut health testing. We talked a little bit about that, but seeing if, if that plays a role. And then lastly, that genomic testing can sometimes play a role. And that's a long list, right? Like nobody is going to need or want to test all of those things. That would be really cost prohibitive, but that's part of where that uniqueness of 
of each situation comes in of which test you actually need, how do we prioritize that to get the data that we want to, to guide that person's approach. And I'm guessing when you work with someone, it's during that first assessment type of session that you're making decisions around what kind of testing to get done. Is that really where that decision is made? Yes. So typically what we'll do is look at whatever lab data they already have from their doctor, and but look at it in a new light, in a different way from that functional approach. And then that along with their history, their symptoms, and even their goals of, of what's important to them and what changes they want to see, we'll prioritize um, what other assessments we might need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause it's, I'm, I mean, technically you could obviously order all that blood work and there are functional providers out there that <laughs> they have like, here's your $2,000 worth of labs that you have to get done to work with me. And, and obviously, you know, everyone's going to have a different perspective on what's the best way to approach something. Some people may be like, well, why not test it and at least like get all the data that you could possibly need to make a decision from. But I do think sometimes testing can be used excessively and it is expensive. Like unfortunately in the functional medicine space, insurance isn't really covering the vast majority of those tests. So it is something where I think if you can kind of pick and choose the ones that would be most helpful. And maybe you can tell me if this is how you work. I know sometimes a lot of the clients I work with that I help them with figuring out their process for supporting their clients as a business coach. One of the things we look at is like, okay, are there certain tests that you really want? Like you're absolutely confident that you should be doing that test. Are there some tests that are like, maybe we'll do that down the road. And I've even learned some stuff. Like I have a client, Amanda Montalvo, who was on the podcast that you may know her, the Hormone Healing RD. She actually talked about how she she strongly believes that mineral testing should come before the Dutch type of hormone testing because there's so much that can be affected by the minerals that it's almost like there's no point of looking at the hormone test until you've fixed the mineral status. So do you have like kind of a hierarchy of most important tests all the way to the ones that are like, okay, this is a tool in the toolbox, but we're not going to use that unless we need to. Is that kind of how you make decisions? Yeah, 100%. And, you know, when we think about mood, you know, all of those nutrients that we think about are cofactors in those processes. And even hormones, I'm sure you've talked about this on the podcast before, can be impacted by you know, glucose regulation and gut health and all these things, nutrient status. And so hormones are typically down the line. We don't always have to test those first. And I think what is underutilized are a lot of the common blood markers that people get at pretty much every single annual physical, that it's just a matter of knowing how to tap into that, how to look at them in that different light that we talked about, not only using the optimal ranges, but what they really say beyond like, are you sick or not, right? There's so much more information. And that's, you know, part of my my training and, and my past experiences, like learning those labs back and forth inside and out to make the most of these panels that are actually really, really affordable that everyone has. Yeah. <laughs> so I think starting there, starting with, you know, the, the pillars that matter most like nutrients and blood sugar relation regulation, and even some of the things around supporting our nervous systems. There's um mm-hmm. a, a lot of education out there on things like the polyvagal theory and helping to, like I talked about that self-soothing component and regulating in the moment so a lot of a lot of things to consider depending on the person. And I feel like that's why it's so important to work with somebody on all of this stuff. Cause first of all, I mean, in a lot of cases you can't order blood work or like different types of labs for yourself. And then even if you can, interpreting the information and also making sure the right things are being addressed in the right order is like, I mean, you've been studying this for years and you're, you know, an expert in it and you also have formal education in, you know, health, nutrition. biology, that kind of thing. So I do think as much as I love the opportunity for self, self treatment, like there's so much stuff that people in general can do for themselves because of the internet and because of all the free content, like hopefully this podcast will give women some ideas about things to look for if they are potentially or, or definitely struggling with PMDD. But it's one of these things where I think we're at this point in you know, the the vastness of information on the internet where, you know, trying to do everything yourself is actually at best going to just take you a really long time and at worst might leave you never getting progress. And so I think that just really highlights why working with someone is so important because it's like, 
trying to figure out all of the the puzzle piece like that when there's so many different layers, I think would be really hard for the average person. Yeah. Well, and hard to do, especially when you're not feeling well, right? Yeah. It becomes very overwhelming, very quickly weeding through all that information. And, and I see this as well with whether someone, you know, reads an article and decides to take a supplement or it's from, unfortunately, even a practitioner who, you know, hasn't run any tests or looked a little bit deeper where it can send them down the wrong road, right? You know, just as an example, Vitex or Chaseberry is a super common supplement with PMDD. And there are times and situations where it's not helpful or could even make the situation worse if someone has pre-existing P- PCOS or high luteinizing hormone already, or they have issues with prolactin in a more medical way. And so it's really important to have someone experienced working with you to help determine what you need, what's only going to help and benefit you. And also, so you're not taking 20 random things (laughs) that you don't need. So definitely important. Yeah. So what would be the first step somebody should take if they suspect that they may have PMDD? The very first step would come back to that tracking to consistently track your symptoms for that two months you can, you know, talk to your doctor and get a diagnosis. And, and then I think seeking support in a way that aligns with what they feel like they need and kind of trusting, you know, their intuition on where to start. You know, there's a lot of alternative therapies that can help, whether it's this, you know, functional medicine, functional nutrition approach for some people, it's, you know, making sure they establish a good, you know, therapy relationship. Some people like to do it all at the same time, but kind of reflecting and layering in what type of support needs to come first to help that person start to function, to feel safe, you know, especially if their symptoms are quite severe. And Is there any resources that somebody may have that could actually help them? Like you were mentioning before that kind of laundry list of symptoms that could indicate a diagnosis. Is that something that somebody could just like download somewhere and look at the symptom list and maybe start to make some, connect some dots for themselves to see if this is something that they need to pursue support with? Yeah. The IAPMD that I mentioned, that International Association of of Premenstrual Disorders, they have a lot of trackers and free resources right on their their website. And you can even use those trackers to, you know, officially log it and, and bring that to your appointment. Mm -hmm. Because I was going to say, I feel like, especially, I mean, (sighs) this time of year or not the time of year, the the unusual time we're in, I don't think necessarily people want to be going to a doctor's appointment unless they have to. And so if there was a way for them to kind of, like you said, track their symptoms and then start to compare that to the list of what's commonly recognized as PMDD symptoms, then it would at least give them some amount of, you know, it's almost like a, it's almost like a threshold of like, okay, is this something that's actually really that severe that I should go? Or is it like, oh, maybe this is really PMS? And not that PMS obviously shouldn't be ignored, but there's stuff that you can do for PMS that's a lot less complicated than a lot of what you've been talking about with PMDD. Because it sounds like PMDD has a lot more involvement of like the neurotransmitters and, you know, it's, it's maybe, I think hormones obviously play a role, but maybe they're not the key issue compared to like PMS, where a lot of times if you just get like estrogen and progesterone imbalance, like for a lot of women that can actually significantly improve that. So I do think it's important for people to kind of know, okay, this is something that I should be seeking help with because it sounds like it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not an easy thing to deal with, or there's not like just this like couple of things that you can do and, oh, now I feel great. Cause maybe that's why people are like, oh, well, if you felt better, and you don't have it anymore. That means you didn't have PMDD in the first place. Cause it's like, if it's that easy to fix for somebody, then it's like, maybe it wasn't PMDD. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and at the same time too, there are, I won't say easy because habit change is never easy, but fundamental things that help most people and at least dip their toe in and get started with, with the habits that will, will make a difference and start to reduce symptoms, kind of lay the foundation. So they have more energy, more resilience to essentially go the whole way and really dive deep in, and address their symptoms. And so um, I started an, an ebook that you can share in, in the podcast notes. It's specifically geared around cravings, but because a lot of people have questions about why do I have cravings? How does this relate to PMDD? But in that, we talk about what I call the peaceful periods plate. So some of these you know, essential nutrition things that everyone should be doing and start with to make sure that they're kind of setting up their body for success to, to take those additional steps to address their condition. 
in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if blood sugar was a big, (laughs) a big contributing factor. And it always is. I was kind of joking the other day, we were teaching program design inside of the Nutrition Business Accelerator. And I was kind of saying like, I feel like most of you are going to end up having blood sugar as being a component of your process. Cause it's like, it's kind of crazy how, you know, somebody having blood sugar out of control can contribute to so many different issues. And I also think it's kind of additionally crazy how many people in our country struggle with it. So I think sometimes I, I've been eating pretty healthy and my mom's a dietitian. So like I've been pretty aware of at least the general nutrition philosophy or the general practices for a long time. And sometimes I really forget how most people start their day or like how they're eating. I mean, I know breakfast is such a huge trigger for either good blood sugar or not good blood sugar. So it's, I always kind of like, I forget. And then I, I'm out in public like eating breakfast or, you know, we're at a hotel and we're seeing what other people are choosing for their breakfast. And I'm like, oh man, no matter so, or no wonder so many people struggle with a variety of health issues because of like just simple things that they could be doing that they're just not aware are affecting their symptoms. Yeah. I I tell my clients or kind of pick on them that they have to earn the right for the advanced supplements. And so a lot of times people want like, okay, give me my fancy test and my fancy supplement plan, but we have to make sure those foundational pieces are there. Otherwise those won't do anything for you. You have to bring those pieces together. And that definitely is part of my process. Um, Like the first phase is, okay, let's make sure you have the nutrients you need, start controlling inflammation, balance blood sugar, and then the, you know, emotional support and kind of emotional regulation piece too comes into play. Mm -hmm. So very important. Awesome. Well, I'm sure you have so much more to share about PMDD and we just really scratched the surface today, but I'm hoping that the conversation really helped anyone who's listening, whether it's themselves or someone in their life that they care about, that they think could be dealing with this condition, just to give them a sense for how to get diagnosed or how to know if it's something they should even be looking for help with and understanding the complexity. Because in some ways, I think if somebody has been working to heal PMDD and they hear like, oh my gosh, there's all these other things that I've never even heard about that can help add to that hope that there's healing possible. Because I think sometimes when you think you've exhausted your your treatment options. It's like, well, I guess this is the way it is. But then if you find out there's like 10 other things that you could be doing that could be helpful, it can be like, oh wait, this isn't the end of the road. It is something that I can get help with. So hopefully that message was received today. And I know Mandy is so knowledgeable and has so much expertise in this topic. So if anyone wants to get support and feels like you're the person they want support from, how can they connect with you? Yeah, you can find me on my website. It is revealfunctionalnutrition.com and on Instagram at pmdd.dietitian. So, and then you'll, I'm sure have in the the show notes of that free ebook if someone wants to get started with some of those foundational habits. Yeah, definitely. We will have Mandy's website and her freebie and her Instagram information in the show notes for this episode over at laurashoenfeldrd.com. So if you guys want to connect with Mandy, find out what it would take to become one of her clients, then all the information that you need will be there. So anyway, Mandy, it was so great to chat with you about this. Um, I learned a lot and I know our listeners will have learned a lot too. And I just really appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. And thanks to those of you for hanging out with us for the last hour or so. And we'll see you next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Are you a nutritionist or dietitian struggling to figure out how much to charge for your programs and services? Maybe you've heard that as a nutritionist, you should just charge what you're worth. But this way of thinking can cause you to either undercharge your clients or work yourself into the ground trying to earn your worth. As a healthcare provider, you can't set up a pricing structure that forces you to sacrifice your own health and well being in the name of your business and your clients but I promise it doesn't have to be this way. When you download my free profit planning workbook, I'll walk you step-by-step through the 10-step process for determining the right pricing for your nutrition business. As a nutritionist, you have the power to completely change someone's life for the better. There's huge value in that. So it's time to stop underselling what you do. By following along with this worksheet, you can determine exactly what you need to charge to achieve your revenue goals with ease. 
I'll teach you everything I've learned about pricing from growing my own nutrition business to over $250,000 in revenue annually and helping other dietitian and nutrition entrepreneurs hit their first 10 to $30,000 months and beyond. To get your free workbook, go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, and grab your copy today. So you no longer have to wonder how to set the right rates for your incredibly valuable nutrition services. That's lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash profit. It's time to make the money that you deserve as a nutritionist, and I can't wait to help you get there. 